the the next speaker is going to be uh, Josiah Hunt. Uh, Josiah uh, started a company. He's the the uh, CEO and president of uh, Pacific Biochar. Uh, Biochar represents some of the uh, interesting promise in terms of uh, rehabilitating old or mismanaged vineyards. So very uh, several very popular uh, vineyards here in California are using biochar to increase the cover crop capacity each year. Um, but I'll let Josiah tell you more about this solution. Josiah, go ahead and uh, if you would um, start us up here. All right. So uh, how looking for you? Audio is good. And the screen share option is share content. There you go. Well, now I'm assuming you can all see my screen, but I can't see any of you. So, um, Daniel, yeah, go. We, we is yeah, there a way, we can see it. Well, is there a way that I can make it so I can still see some of you guys too? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. But it looks, it looks great. It looks, it looks great. Go for it. Well, I'm just gonna. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Scott Hunt, um, President and CEO of Pacific Biochar. Um, I'll start this uh, slide. Uh, and this opening slide is, I think, um, really captures a lot in this one picture. Um, I believe this was early 2017, might have been 2017. Uh, this is at Fry Vineyards up in Mendocino, uh, and, and this picture is a lot of the story that I'm going to be talking about here. So this biochar was being used to improve the soil health in the vineyard. Um, biochar in this big pile here was all generated from forest residue from high fire hazard areas. Probably it's it's some logging residue, but also a large portion of it is fire hazard thinning where they're trying to improve the forest health to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire. Um, this was then 18 months later, by fire itself. So here in this picture, you can see the forest in the background, which is a lot of the resource where the biomass is coming from to make this biochar here in the foreground. And because of the state of so much of California's forest right now, catastrophic wildfire went through, burned down all the forest and continued on right through the vineyard and some really nice old homes they had there as well. So it shows a lot, I think, a little bit of the urgency that you may hear in my voice, um, that we have a climate change. We have enough problems already and in the environment that we've caused, such as forest health management, and generally, we've been a little bit aggressive on our soils, causing depleted soil health. Um, and all of that is being exacerbated by climate change and the growing need of uh, a larger population of humans. So, biochar offers a climate mitigation tool where we can basically do coal in reverse. We can take carbon captured from the air and put it in the soil for thousands of years. And by doing so, we can help adapt to a changing climate through water conservation, nutrient management, and soil again. So I'm gonna go through that and show you that now. Um, I, uh, don't worry if you don't know, uh, you're in probably the majority. Um, biochar is essentially just charcoal. I think charcoal is often even a little bit mysterious. Um, charcoal is biomass that became so hot, such as you can see in the picture on the left here. It went through what we would call a thermal transformation. It got so hot, it was glowing and shooting out photons 
but was able to cool down without becoming ash. And then that new form, it is resistant to change. Hold on a second. What do we live in now, huh? Um, anyways, um, that thermal that thermal chemical transformation. When I don't I don't know if you guys can see me here, but just you'll look at me for a little minute here. Um, the biomass has has these long carbon chains, you know, basically hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. These hydrocarbons, and and when it gets really hot, the the way that the carbon is 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 associated with itself changes. It becomes these air. I'm sorry. It becomes these aliphatic chains, and then it reforms into a more of an aromatic ring type form. The carbon bonds to itself in a ring type form that is highly resistant to enzymes breaking it down into um, into smaller forms. So that's why that's sort of the molecular reason why this form of carbon is so recalcitrant and can last for thousands of years without being broken down. Um, biochar is a rather new word, um, but it is definitely not terrible. So the word biochar exists because agrochar was already patented or trademarked. So they had to come up with something else. So they thought, hey, let's take biomass charcoal and we'll mash it up. And from what I understand, that is the birth of the word biochar. Um, the material itself though, uh, you know, charcoal, I think a more scientifically accurate description is pyrogenic organic matter. Um, it's been around as long as fire and plant life estimated to be about 350 million years ago and has been part of soil development since that time, as we can find in geological studies. Um, this, this is a, this is a report. International Panel on Climate Change. This came out last year in August. Um, and this was a special report on land, climate change and land. So I have the title here right here. It's a rather large title. Climate Change and Land, an IPCC special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse glass fluxes in terrestrial ecosystems. Quite a lot there, but I mean, you can see how it's all, it's all part of one big you know, thing, basically human survival on a changing planet, how we can mitigate and adapt. Um, chapter four in land degradation had the most references to biochar out of all the chapters. And this particular section, I thought was, it's a little bit deep. It's a little bit of a deep dive, but again, it, they really succinctly kind of caught a lot of the stuff here. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole, it's such a good job. And I know that's really boring, but right here you can read along with me but they did a good job the role of biochar in biochars generally have high porosity high surface area and surface active properties that lead to high active, i'm sorry high absorptive and adsorptive capacity especially after interaction with soil as a result of these properties could contribute to avoiding reduce and reversing land degradation through the following documented benefits. Improved nutrient use efficiency due to reduced leaching of nitrate and ammonium and increased availability of phosphorus in soils with high phosphorus fixation capacity, potentially reducing nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer requirements. Uh, management of heavy metals and organic pollutants through reduced bioavailability of toxic elements by reducing availability through immobilization due to increased pH and redox effects and adsorption on biochar surfaces, thus providing a means of remediating contaminated soils and enabling their utilization for food production. Also by stimulating beneficial soil organisms, including earthworms and mycelial fungi. Also through improved porosity and water holding capacity. I think for California, really important here water holding capacity, particularly in sandy soils, enhancing microbial function during drought. 
job of succinctly organizing this. And the fact that this was published in the International Panel on Climate Change means that it went through an incredibly rigorous process and had to re be reviewed by hundreds of other um, high level scientists before being released. Um, I'm going to now elaborate on a lot of what was talked about there. Again, I kind of went over this. I'll you can see here, this, this kind of illustrates it. So, wood becomes char in the process releasing gases. Usually when we have a fire, it's the gases we're burning. And then later it's those burning embers that provide heat without flame. We can use those gases energy production for, for, we can use them directly as heat, or also we can transform them into um, electrical energy through boilers or even make gases with that, such mm -hmm. as natural gas alternative or even Reference condensed solar. gases. Um, nice. Uh, here's, um, sorry, I just, I got distracted there. Uh, here's a, here's an interesting part about biochar is that generally soil organic matter is analyzed through loss on ignition. You take a soil sample, you dry the soil sample, and then you burn that dried soil sample. You burn it. And you burned it, you measure the weight loss. Whatever disappeared was basically organic matter. Um, that was, so your loss of ignition analysis does not differentiate between charcoal organic matter and non-charcoal organic matter. And it's the most common analytical method we use. When much more expensive and time-consuming analytical methods are used, that do differentiate between charcoal organic matter and non-charcoal organic matter. It is found that charcoal organic matter is basically everywhere. Because the calcitrant, even if it's produced only in small amounts during fire events, it does accumulate. And that charcoal organic matter generally makes up 10 to as much as 50% of the organic matter in soils. Um, it's already everywhere. And so, as we have a more nuanced understanding of organic matter and the different ways in which we develop, maintain, and stabilize soil organic matter, it's important to recognize that biochar has historically been kind of part of that, even when we haven't acknowledged it individually as that. And it's also easy from a management perspective when we simply biochar back into that pie chart. So that's why I put in red here, put it back in that pie chart. Because when you think a lot about the, the benefits of soil organic matter, biochar is kind of parallel with that. It's it's part of that. So um, and the stability of biochar here, I kind of make a little quick mention. Um, generally has a decay rate of about 10% per 100 years. So it's going to be around for a while. Um, biochar and water. Um, so here we have some hydraulic conductivity. Uh, graphs where they added biochar to a sand and to a clay. So here the biochar dramatically reduced the hydro hydraulic conductivity, basically helping hold the water in that sand media and, and significantly. So it dramatically um, increased the hydraulic conductivity. So the water was more able to easily pass through the clay soil. Because the biochar is so porous, it's not necessarily that the the water is just going to pass through and be gone. Oftentimes, the water is held within the biochar, but in a plant available way. So, through these means, biochar is able to increase the plant available water in both a sandy soil and a clay soil. And with sandy soils, we find they tend to be a little bit more sensitive, that a relatively small amount of biochar can have a significant impact. With clay soils, sometimes you need a lot of biochar till you get to having significant impact. But clay soils with high organic matter can be incredibly productive with enough organic matter, biochar and other organic matter to help open them up so the water that falls can penetrate, be held within the dot, and still be plant available. Um, available nutrients. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a problem in multiple ways, uh, particularly with nitrogen. Nitrogen um, Nitrogen loss, I mean, nitrogen is part of what makes, you know, part, is one of the most important things in, involved with yield. And oftentimes uh, it's highly inefficient. A lot of nitrogen is lost either through leaching, like you can see in this graph here. A lot of nitrogen is lost through leaching, 
in California that's going into aquifers. In many other places, it's going in surface runoff into rivers. Um, biochar can help hold nitrogen and other plant nutrients in the topsoil in a plant available form. It's not locked away through chemical bonding, but necessarily kind of there's different bonding types, but it's basically held in a large form in the root zone and available to plants. Biochar also, well, I'll just go to the next slide here. Uh, sorry, we'll be the next one after that. Uh, biochar and heavy metals in, in the works like a charcoal filter to help hold nutrients in your topsoil. It, it seems to be very helpful with heavy metals and toxic organic compounds. So where soils have high levels of heavy metals, such as a lot of soils in California have naturally occurring high levels of cadmium. And sometimes the cadmium can be so such high levels that it really causes a lot of problems. With grapes, it's not necessarily in the leaf tissue, but because the cadmium can be in such high levels, from what I understand, it can cause problems in the root tissue because uh, the roots are kind of working so hard to block that out or something to that effect. Um, but with, uh, with lettuce, with, bra with the whole, whole brassicas, and also with uh, now a, a big crop cannabis that are bioaccumulators of heavy metals, um, the ability of biochar to reduce plant uptake is actually of, of quite big interest now. Um, and basically it works like a charcoal filter the heavy metals stick to the biochar and then because none of the biology is particularly interested in, in, in that metal, it just kind of stays there. So it lowers the bioavailability of these heavy metals. And the basic result that we find is that there's lower levels of heavy metals in the um, and, and, and toxic organic compounds in the plant tissue and also in the organisms in the soil. Um, biochar supports uh, microorganisms in the soil, so bacteria, fungi, um, and all the allies. Um, it's just got incredibly, I mean, it's hard to describe. I mean, the pictures, I'll show some later that, that kind of do it justice, but basically you have a plant body with vascular tissue. If there's tubes and tunnels and all kinds of, you know, structural tissue in that plant body. And then when it becomes biochar, a lot of that structure remains. So you have all this cap, you have all these capillary tubes, you have all these tubes and tunnels that were designed in the plant body for transporting food and water um, up and down and sideways um, that basically get frozen in form. So the interior surface of the biochar is functional, not just the exterior surface. And so it just creates an amazing habitat for um, bacteria, fungi, and, and, and all the allies there. Um, and here you can see in this picture, Fungi just embracing that little chunk of biochar in a compost pile in my backyard. In this picture here, um, this was a piece of biochar I pulled out of the soil where you have roots coming out of the biochar. You can see that evident here in these pictures. The roots go into and are coming back out of the biochar, visibly showing the utility of the interior surface area. Um, oh, and sorry, with, with that as well, this has a lot to do with the nutrient cycling because by supporting the microbial community, you're also helping with the availability of nutrients over time, because sometimes there might be nutrients in the soil that cannot be accessed by the plant in sufficient quantity at that right time, because you just had this awesome week in spring and the plant just really, really wants a bunch of phosphorus at that moment, but it can't quite get it fast enough. So by supporting greater microbial activity, you can increase the capacity for your plant to be able to access nutrients when, when needed. Um, so here's some skin photos of biochar up close to help show the relationship between fungi here on the left. So this is a chunk of biochar and here's um, our vascular, a vascular arbuscle mycorrhizae. This is a, you know, um, this is some of the, our best favorite kind of guys here. Uh, just plugging right into the biochar. You see the fungal hyphae just plugging right in. So the size is quite friendly there to fungi. Um, in this, in this other picture here, you can see bacterial colonies. Uh, this was a composting analysis and and these are just clusters of bacterial colonies um, finding refuge within the biochar there, helping show some size reference and why the biochar can provide such great refuge and habitat for them. Um, so with these abilities to help hold water and house microorganisms, um, one of the interesting effects also when applying biochar to soils is that it, it helps to seem, it, it seems to help in the accumulation of other organic matter. So by putting biochar in the soils, we find that it helps 
the mechanisms could be used to be the results are that we increase other organic matter. So this is showing that over 10 years, they, it, that where the biochar was applied, there was more carbon gathered and sequestered in that soil beyond just the carbon when compared to the control where no biochar was added. Um, this was more a recent one. Uh, this was six, this was out in Iowa. This was um, a soil carbon increase by twice the amount of the biochar that was applied after six years. Um, negative priming is a positive thing. That means that you're, you're helping build organic matter faster, basically. Um, biochar seems to work with composting. Um, when you can reduce the, you know, you can reduce the nutrient loss, particularly nitrogen, which is so such a volatile little uh, tricky little guy there. Um, so biochar seems to dramatically reduce nitrogen leach, uh, volatilization as well as um, and that can help the composting process. It seems to help the microorganisms. So the compost finishes faster and to a greater degree. And it just seems to help a lot with moisture regulation and microbial support and reducing nitrogen loss in the compost process. And in that process, the biochar is not diminished. It is actually improved. So the biochar, because it's so recalcitrant, it's not being decayed during the composting process, but rather the biochar in, in this environment with nutrients, and microorganisms going crazy, having it like a frat party and just seeking out and colonizing every surface they can. These, the biochar surface, which is high surface area becomes incredibly more complicated with organic acids, plant available nutrients, living and dead microorganisms, all kinds of enzymes and glues. And it becomes a much more functional um, material during the process. So co-composting with biochar is just a, it's kind of a win-win. And this is a really big one because in a lot of cases, we're applying biochar with compost anyways. So if we're applying biochar with compost anyways, why not mix them at the beginning of the composting process and get the biggest bang for the buck? I think for a lot of you, uh, the, the vineyards that are large enough to be composting your own, and wineries that are large enough to be composting your own um, grape residues, the pomace and seeds and such, um, this can, can really help to uh, compost those materials better and, and have more valuable product. Um, all right, let's get to the good stuff. Biochar applications in vineyards. Um, probably go through this. I have a feeling I'm getting low on time. But this is the good part here. So biochar applications in vineyards. Here's just some suggested application rates. Um, tons per acre, depending on soil type, plow depth and budget. What we're finding is that for pre uh, which is one of the best times that we think so far that from what we found to apply the biochar, it's important to put it directly down the planting row. You can always add it to the middle row later, but during pre-plant is your only time to really put that biochar at depth down the planting row to really help give your vines a better chance. And this seems to be highly effective. And I'll show you some results about that later. For established vineyard, there is a lot of uh, benefit we found also in adding the biochar down the planting row, particularly if there's an active cover crop management program and the biochar can help in that cover crop management program. Um, in some of the uh, other vineyards that we've worked with, they do a French plow where they basically excavate all the material out of that row in between the vines and then, sh and then throw it back on. And that presents an opportunity there to throw a bunch of biochar down. So you throw the biochar down, excavate it out, throw it back on, and then it's kind of mixed in. And that seems to help. We're doing some work, especially with some Central Valley um, vineyards that have a lot of trouble holding on to their water. Into their soil deep enough for the for the plants to be able to get better use of it. Um, field trial from from Italy here, where they did our, um, down the middle row, and uh, this was a vineyard dry farmed Merlot planted in 1995. They put eight tons per acre of biochar dry weight chisel plowed down to about one foot depth in the middle row, uh, sandy clay loam textured soil with highly compacted. Uh, just below one foot there, probably because they kept on chisel plowing it. Um, the effect was up to a 60%, up, up to a 66% increase in productivity. And on average, it was about a 35 or something percent increase in productivity. But the interesting part is that the, the greatest increase in productivity happened on the year with the least beneficial rainfall. I guess the, the, the most problematic rainfall was the year that they had the greatest yield increase. 
um, showing that the biochar really performed best, particularly when faced with adversity. It, the, 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 this improvement in soil health really helped these plants survive through adversity, which I think gets to this, this concept of like biochar being a, a, a way to help put carbon back in the ground. But let's be real, I don't know, if we're, I mean, it's a little bit late here, we're kind of screwed and it's only a matter of like how screwed we are. So we better learn how to adapt. And so biochar offers a way to help mitigate how screwed we are, but also to adapt because it's not, we're not going to be hundred percent successful in getting back to the hollow scene. So a way to help adapt for a changing climate. So here's some work that we did locally here in California. Well, this is down in, in the um, Salinas Valley here with a big project funded by the Department of Water Resources. We had the opportunity to do eight acres field trial, um, four different treatments, well, three treatments and control. This is we're on our fourth year now with this our first harvest last year. We're gonna do another harvest this year. Second harvest will be very telling. We're excited to see that. Um, here's the basic plot design here. Again, we ripped it deep down the planting row. We've been doing work with Monterey Pacific for a few years. We did a various other things and we found that this is what we like to do for pre-planting, rip that stuff deep down the, down the uh, planting row. We did 15 tons of compost, 10 tons of biochar, and then both together. And we did a replicated field trial, four replicates each randomized and went to town. It's not perfectly uniform. There is uh, the opposite of uniformity here. Um, Vineview did a great job showing that. Um, but here are these are the EVI where they helped adjust for that lack of uniformity here. Um, here's the total. This is, uh, look to these numbers here. You're gonna wanna see the graph on the left here. The difference between the red and the green um, is showing the vigor, less vigor on the red, more vigor on the green, of course. Um, this is all plots together. This is just the control where nothing was applied. And we're just gonna watch as there's less red and more green as we move along to the amendments. Biochar alone, pretty darn good. A lot more in the green, a lot less red. Compost, much more vigor. I'm sorry, this is a metric of vigor, like foliage coverage um, and vine vigor. Um, compost, even more vigor than the biochar. Compost plus biochar, the most vigor of all. Um, here we do cluster counts. So we're not just looking at vigor, we're actually looking like how does it translate into yield? And actually the biochar had the most cluster counts um, last year. Um, and when it came to harvest, the biochar also had the greatest harvest. So again, yield does not always necessarily mean harvest. Uh, in this situation, that was definitely the case. The, um, the biochar alone seemed to have a much greater yield. This was about a 45% increase in yield. Unfortunately, we did not take Quality metrics in year one, we'll be doing that this year. Um, the Revaz index, the fruit weight versus pruning weight, um, the biochar was much higher in, the, in that range that according to the Revaz index is optimal. Um, here's the cluster counts from May of this year. Now everything's even up and this is kind of what we expected that the vigor of last year is gonna be translating into more yield this year because all of that extra leaf growth has gotta be helping create more sugars to get better vine girth and root development. And so I think that we're gonna be seeing the, the yields are gonna, should be evening out this year. And we will be doing some quality metrics at least. Um, so that'll be really interesting to see what happens there. Um, this is where, I, I know it's kind of nuts and bolts here, but where, you know, I, I, I'm really for about 10 years, particularly because it's a way we can help save the planet, but it doesn't rely upon altruism alone it can actually be, actually be a profitable way to help save the planet. And, and this is, so this is showing some of the economic assessment here. Um, that yield increase where biochar was applied was about 1.3 ton per acre at a great price of one pound, that would be $2,600 per acre. The cost of that biochar, I sold it to him, so I know, um, was $240 per ton delivered. So that's about 10 tons per acre, right? That gives us 24. So they safely paid for, the biochar paid for itself already in the first harvest, and it's gonna last for a thousand years. So this seems like we, like it could be pretty darn profitable here. If this holds true in future harvests, the value of this single application over time, after five years of harvest would be 10,600, after 10 years would be 23,000, and after, four, after 20 years would be nearly $50,000 uh, of gain from that $2,400 single application. Um, 
where you could expect to find the greatest. Okay, okay, okay. I'm getting the, I'm getting the call here. Move on. The the uh, the hook is coming here. Uh, where you could expect to find the greatest maximum potential economic gain would be where you have poor soils because there's the most room for improvement, high value crops where the improvement can turn into high dollars, and low organic matter again kind of tied into the poor soil. Um, this is a great way to find the greatest economic gain um, for why biochar has risen to one of the top natural climate solutions is because it provides climate change mitigation and adaptation to drought resiliency, food security, while providing carbon dioxide removal and storage by increasing solar organic matter, including biochar. Um, you can produce it on the farm. Uh, this, there are some pictures of some vineyard prunings that have been, or vineyard, uh, when they ripped out the vineyard, um, let it sit long enough to get dry and you can make some biochar in clean burning piles. Uh, here's some pictures that were taken in February. Um, you can you can have some little equipment to do this as well. These guys are obviously looking for more clients in the vineyard industry. Um, our company produces biochar in a centralized facility, biomass power plants that have been modified for biochar production. Um, we're utilizing forest residues from catastrophic wildfire areas to um, to produce biochar in these modified biomass power plants, but they're still producing power, but now also producing biochar. Again, showing the forest areas, we're helping mitigate wildfire management, um, showing some of the scale of what we're working with here, clean emissions, truckloads of biochar, facilities, ready to deliver to vineyards. Uh, this is one of the vineyard clients that we work with um, in the Sonoma County area. We've got trucks ready and waiting. Um, biochar has been a interesting idea to many for years, but now it is something that is, you know, it's a growing industry, but it's ready enough to be engaged with at scale. You can deliver you know, tonnage for about 250 to 500 bucks. Thank you so much. Um, yep. Thank you so much for your time and on to the next. Cool. Thank you uh, very much, Josiah. That was a, that was a really, um, that was a really good uh, presentation on biochar, and it had a lot of information that I I didn't know uh, was available. So, um, you know, part of part of being a part of the climate change um, uh, webinar is to, to find new strategies and new solutions. And I think that um, your company is out there is out there doing that. So we really appreciate you you uh, you coming out and, and giving us a talk. So thanks for coming.